What do you want, dirty hands? So, Shadow and Bone, the show you guys have been asking me to talk about the most in the last few weeks, I finally watched it. It's Netflix's latest attempt at reviving the YA fantasy genre that got oversaturated way too quickly in the early 2010s and died prematurely along with a Divergent franchise that was never completed because it was just that boring. When you fall down, I'll pick you back up. No, I won't die in a hole. But it's 2021, we're living in a post-COVID world where anything is possible now and things are just really different. Jenna Marbles has left the internet, Superman is gonna be black now, and I started eating vegetables, which trust me, is the most unbelievable of the three. So Netflix was like, okay, we'll just bring back young adult fantasy shit. And they made Shadow and Bone, which is adapted from a 2012 novel of the same name by American author Lee Bardugo. I mean, they did make Fade the Wink Saga first, but I like to pretend like that doesn't exist. Shadow and Bone tells the story of Alina Starkov, a young lady who lives in a kingdom known as Rafka with her bestie Mal and serves in the army as a cartographer. Alina is an orphan and she lives a quiet life, or at least as quiet as it can be in this world, but everything changes when she and Mal are sent on a mission to cross the fold, which is this big dark scary cloud thing that separates countries and where terrifying creatures are roaming around waiting to kill people. And the mission goes wrong and the fleet is attacked by these creatures and Alina discovers she is a Grisha. They're like wizards. They're not exactly described as wizards, but they're wizards. But she's not just any Grisha. Alina is something known as a Sun Summoner, an extremely rare being capable of generating powerful light out of nothing. And people have been waiting for her since forever because she can apparently get the world rid of the fold because of reasons. Yeah, the show doesn't do a great job at explaining things, but we'll get back to that in a minute. So now that she's the chosen one of the wizards, Alina becomes the target of everybody and she has to fight for her life and train to be able to destroy the fold, so she's taken under the wing of the Grisha general and then shenanigans happen. That's the gist of the story, it's really vague and I'll explain why in a minute, but for now, what did I think about Shadow and Bone? Well, let's just put it this way. I liked it but I didn't love it. Shadow and Bone is fine. It's okay. I can't really say it's great, but it would also be unfair to say it's garbage because it's not. It's just right in the middle for me. And I think there's a very specific reason why, and that's because seeing the conversation about it online and seeing the messages you guys have been sending me on Instagram over the last couple of weeks, it seems like the majority of people who really love Shadow and Bone are the people who have read the books. Why? because they know more, they have more knowledge of the context behind certain aspects of the story that were poorly explained or not explained at all in the show. See, that's kind of a problem I have with the later Harry Potter movies. I get that weird feeling that the last four movies in the franchise were made by people who assumed anyone who will watch these films have already read the books. And so there are things in them that are just kind of brushed over and simply don't make sense if you haven't read the novels. That wasn't a problem for me because I've read the Harry Potter books a million times, but I do remember remember some of my friends asking questions that made me realize that, oh yeah, if you haven't read the books, this moment within the context of the movie makes no sense and it kinda comes out of nowhere. One of the best examples of that is in Deathly Hallows Part 2 when Harry talks to a bunch of ghosts before going to Voldemort to die. The ghost of Lupin tells him something about his son and how he will understand why he had to die to save the world or whatever, and my friend just turned to me and was like, what the fuck do you mean his son? What son? And that's when I realized, oh yeah. The movie never say that Tonks and Lupin had a kid together. They barely brush over the fact that they're a couple in one or two scenes and then they die, but it's never really explained that Tonks got pregnant and had a baby right before she joined the Battle of Hogwarts. It made sense to me because I knew the context from the books, so it never occurred to me that yeah, if you're someone who just watches the movie, this crucial scene between Harry and Lupin makes absolutely no sense and that's a major fault on the movie. Part. Well, Shadow and Bone feels the same. I can't exactly confirm it because I haven't read the books, but I got that same vibe that certain things that didn't necessarily make sense to me as a casual audience member would only be understood by people who have read the books. Like the show brushes over things and barely takes the time to explain information that I later realized was really fucking important. Either that or they just give you the information like way later than they probably should, which actually leads me to my biggest problem with this series. Shadow and Bone is a show that takes way too 
too long to get to the point, which often makes the story very confusing or flat out incomprehensible. Having to wait like four or five episodes to receive very basic and important information about the world we're in is not the best thing for an audience that isn't already familiar with the lore. I mean, call me crazy, but I don't think it was a good idea to explain what the Fold is and where it comes from in episode 4. Most of the show is about the Fold, it's responsible for all of the rules in this world. This is the type of exposition we should be getting at the very beginning, not halfway through the story. I mean, that's unless you're purposefully entertaining the idea of a mystery, but that's not what this show does. So even though a number of aspects of the story are quite interesting, it's hard to get fully invested. The middle part of the show just drags on forever and you really just have to wait for it to get to the point, and you feel the drag because the beginning of the show doesn't explain anything to you. So you just have to wait for things to become clear. There were several moments, especially in the first two or three episodes, where I had no idea what was going on or what the characters were talking about. And it's not that I wasn't paying attention, it's just that the show was throwing a whole lot of lore at my face without really explaining any of it, and I was kind of struggling to keep up. Which makes sense because it appears that the so-called Grishaverse is like a really big world. Like throughout the show, the story is in full motion and you still have no idea what any of it means. The characters just walk around discussing crucial elements of the plot and using made up fantasy words that mean nothing without context, but for the most part, that context is not given to you until the last third of the show. So I just had a lot of questions that were kind of like mashing together. What is this magical object they're trying to get and why is it so important? Who is this guy? What's his goal? Why should I be afraid of him? Why do we never see him again? What is this big foggy thing? Where did it come from? What are these creatures? What exactly is a Grisha? What the hell is the deal with the CGI stag? What is a Darkling and why is everyone talking about them? How how did Daenerys forget about the Iron Fleet? Wait, no, that's the wrong show. You get my point. The show kind of lacks effort when it comes to explaining the world and its rules, and I thought that sucked because, like I said, it really looks like a rich and very detailed universe, and I liked those. I was interested in it. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to know what was going on. But Shadow and Bone is a little messy, and it shows very early on. I think there's just way too many characters, and it's hard to keep track of all of them because most of them are quite underdeveloped. I'm sorry, ma'am. You seem like an important character in this story, but I don't remember your name. And because the show doesn't explain things all that well, the character's motivations also become very unclear. Like this guy is in the show in every single episode. He has a pretty big storyline and I still don't understand what his motivations are. Like he's here and he's doing things, but I don't know why. We never learn anything about him. I have absolutely no idea why he is in this story. Who are you? Same with certain actions and motivations that are just thrown at us way too late. Like someone orders the assassination of Alina in the finale and his motivations seem to be political. Like he mentions that he doesn't want her to destroy the void because it could threaten the independence of their country. And it looks like a lot of information goes into that, but not only is that conflict only introduced halfway into the finale, but it's also never explained beyond that one line. She could destroy the fold. Then she's a threat to our independence. That's it. That's the only explanation we get. It's so frustrating. There's so much wasted potential in this because this show has a lot of storytelling that's not necessarily lazy, but just very clumsy. However, it's not all bad. The show has its moments. The first thing I will give to the show is this. The action sequences are pretty fun. And it looks good. The show looks good. And I really like the world. There are some pretty solid shots in this show. I like this shot and this shot. And look at this shot, it's pretty fucking epic. And the fight scenes are also really ambitious with how they're filmed at times and they're pretty exciting. They really put a lot of effort into those visuals and you can tell, it, it's just, this show looks really good. That said, those really neat and exciting action sequences are often ruined by the dialogue. And oh boy, the dialogue. You robbed me of my brother, now I robbed you of your life. I really should have shot you in the head. Yeah. Shh, 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 shh. Ah. Should have stopped.
don't know you were ahead. Wow, that, that was really lame. I mean, the first one was bad, but that one, Jesus, it hurts. So yeah, despite my many criticisms of the show, I do think there's a lot to like about Shadow and Bone. It's not reinventing the wheel or anything. This is all very basic fantasy stuff that you've already seen a million times, but I'm fine with that. So let's start breaking it down. And as you probably know, we're gonna start with the characters. Alina Starkov. Alina is fine. I don't have that big of an opinion about her. She's okay. She's a little dull as a protagonist, but like she's not particularly awful or unlikable or anything like that. I think the worst part of her character is just that she's a little boring, unengaging, and she can be pretty dumb at times. Jessie Mae Lee definitely makes the best of it. Like she's really good in the role. You can tell she did her best with what she was given. I recognize her from a very fun little short film called Travelooper that came out a couple years ago. Highly recommend it if you haven't watched it I think it's on YouTube but yeah it's really cool to see her in the main role here even if Alina is not the most interesting her angsty personality kind of gets annoying after a while and at times she feels kind of stiff she doesn't really react to things aside from a few scenes where she gets to show a bit more emotion she always seems very blank. Usually you only get to find out how she feels about things when she writes letters to Mal. The show very quickly tells you that Alina is smart and very resourceful and they attempt to stay consistent with that for the most part, but there is a huge portion of this show where she just kind of hangs around and does nothing while being very angsty, so it's not exactly a defining trait of her character. There's also the issue of age inappropriate casting that plagues Hollywood, so I don't really know how old these characters are supposed to be. In my head they're like 22, 23-ish, but I wouldn't be surprised if the show was like, nah, they're 12. But I assume they're meant to be teenagers, I just can't really see them as teenagers because they just don't look like teenagers. I was also way over Alina's weird romance with Mal by like episode 4. It's this very basic, we're just friends but we're obviously in love type of thing, and that's fine, but the show just overdoes it to a point that's just really annoying. Both Alina and Mal have character traits in the beginning that could be developed into something great but it's all thrown out the window and by the halfway point of the show their only personality is like missing each other that's all they ever think about that's all they ever talk about like Alina is told that she can stop the war with her power like children are dying and shit she has this huge revelation that she is the only person currently known to the world who can save the world but she barely reacts to it she doesn't give a shit all she talks about is wanting to see Mal she doesn't want to do anything before Mal arrives she can't use her powers because of Mal, she can't sleep because of Mal, like we get it, they're in love. Their obsession with one another got really irritating to me and I just stopped caring. In fact, that's a larger problem with Alina as a whole. She never really feels like she cares one bit about, you know, saving the world. She doesn't care about training, she doesn't really give a shit about learning how to end the war. There's no sense of urgency, no sense of drive. She just kinda hangs around with her two gal pals in the castle, either being angsty and sad over Mal or giggling and gossiping with her friends like it's an episode of Bridgerton. Like everyone is telling her, yo, my ninja, we got no time, shit is awful, people are dying, you should be doing everything in your power to fix things. You're the only person who can save us. And Alina is just like, okay. And then she does anything but that. Why are you here eating figs, hmm? You should be training every waking moment to tear down the fault. How many more Ravkin children need to be orphaned to this war because you are afraid to face the truth? She never reacts to it. She's more interested in her caretaker having a crush on a guy. She really wants to go see the circus that's in town. And also she really wants to flirt with that hot sorcerer dude and she sneaks into his bedroom, which by the way is kind of creepy. Maybe don't sneak into people's bedroom uninvited. And at first I didn't mind. I thought her arc was gonna be about her stepping into that role of the chosen one. But until I realized the show is really awful at conveying the passage of time. So I thought she was in the castle for like a few days and I was being really compassionate like oh she just has to get used to the new situation. But then someone mentions in a fleeting line that it hasn't been a few days. It's been several months since she arrived. So like do something Alina. What the fuck? The show does such a terrible job when it comes to presenting Alina as the hero we should be rooting for. She just comes across as this all-powerful 
being who's just not all that interested in helping people. Like, she's just being lazy. And she remains like that till the finale. This whole time, she has the power to change things, but she just doesn't. Which is probably the main reason why I found her so boring. The point is that the more I watched the show, the more I found the character of Alina to be incredibly lame. But she's not, like, hateful like certain characters in these types of stories. She's fine. Oh yeah, and then she makes out with Ben Barnes. I mean, isn't he an adult? Isn't he like hundreds of years old? Isn't she a teenager? Hold on. Yeah, she's a teenager, what the fuck? Why do these shows keep doing this? Anyways, their romance comes out of nowhere and they don't really have any chemistry and then it's quickly thrown away when Ben Barnes is finally revealed as the most obvious surprise villain of all time. Seriously, if you didn't call it like an episode one, I don't know what you're doing. And then from that point on, Alina becomes really stupid. After she's told by Madame Hooch that Ben Barnes is actually evil, she's sent in some sort of secret tunnel and Madame Hooch tells her, okay, you you have to go through this tunnel, turn right at this specific point and you'll be in a safe zone. Stay there and wait, we'll figure this out. But then, for no reason, Alina's just like, nah, I'm going to not do that. So instead, she goes outside in the open, finds a random carriage and locks herself inside of a chest attached behind it. She doesn't know whose carriage that is or where it's going, but she somehow thought this was a better idea than going to the magical hidden tunnel the super powerful witch told her to go to. And not only that, but she puts herself in a situation where she is stuck inside of a chest that can only be opened from the outside. Girl! Do you need a Kit Kat? She's so stupid, and I found myself laughing at her for most of the second half of the show. Also, this is less of a problem about her character, but still, I gotta say it. The show is so bad at explaining what her powers actually are. She's a Sun Summoner. Okay, sure, she can destroy the phone. Okay, but why? How? Is she the only one? Sometimes the show talks about the Sun Summoner like it's that one legendary being which would make Alina the only one of her kind. But other times they insinuate Sun Summoners are rare, but there isn't only one. And aside from that, her powers are just super inconsistent. Sometimes she can just make little balls of light that are very inoffensive. Other times she can kind of temporarily blind people by throwing light at their faces, which makes sense. But then, out of nowhere, her powers suddenly turn into a weird plot device? She can fight with light now? She can throw light and hurt people with it? She can heal wounds with light? She can use light as a shield from like people shooting at her and stuff? Like suddenly Alina's light power just becomes anything the writers need it to be during a scene. So sometimes it's very inoffensive and two minutes later she becomes a god and she's fucking invincible. And I know she's supposed to be the chosen one or whatever, but I just don't like it when stories are inconsistent with power levels because it takes away all of the tension. I mentioned Harry Potter earlier, so I'm gonna use that example again, but in Harry Potter, Harry is the chosen one, and he's a good wizard in his own right, but it's also made very clear that he's just a kid, and there's no fucking way he can take Lord Voldemort in a fight one-on-one. -on -one. And what I really like is that the story stays consistent with that all throughout. There's never a point where Harry's power level just magically turns into god mode, and he suddenly bodies Voldemort. Like, that never happens. It wouldn't make sense. It would just be lazy writing. After Dumbledore dies, Voldemort effectively becomes the most powerful wizard known to the world. That's a very consistent theme in the plot. Harry can't just fight him. If things come down to a normal fight between Harry and Voldemort, Harry will lose every single time, there's no question there. Even in their very last fight, their final battle, Voldemort spends the entire fight just toying with Harry and throwing him around like a basketball. It's so easy for him to beat Harry that at one point he just stops using magic at all and just slaps Harry in the face. The only reason Harry wins against Voldemort isn't because he bested him in a fight out of nowhere, it's because he knew something Voldemort didn't and used that against him. But unfortunately, and for some reason, most stories don't do that. Whenever writers get to the point where the hero needs to triumph, they completely abandon all logic and the hero will become so unbelievably powerful out of nowhere and just beat the shit out of the villain. 
villain and I hate that. And Shadow and Bone kind of falls into that category. We barely ever see Alina train, like ever. It's repeated a million times that she kind of sucks at using her powers. But then, in the last two episodes, without any explanation, she just turns into fucking Thanos and she just spends the rest of the show going sicko mode on everybody. And then, in the last few minutes of the finale, Alina finally becomes an interesting character and she's like, hey, we should, we should probably destroy the fold. And everyone is like, yeah, we've been, we've been waiting for you to do that. And she goes, okay, well, I'm gonna leave now, but one day I'll come back and I'll destroy it for you guys. <laughs> Okay, let's move on. Alina's fine. I don't love her. I don't hate her. She's just kind of there and I don't care. All right, next. General Ben Barnes. I don't actually remember his name. Like I said earlier, Ben Barnes is the most predictable secret villain ever, but I can live with that. Unfortunately for him though, his character falls into a major writing flaw that particularly grinds my gears and that's where the problem starts. You see, when writers try to do a secret villain who has to be revealed in a twist, they do this thing where the second the audience finds out he's a villain, the villain inexplicably drops his act, even when that doesn't make sense within the context of the story. And now that we know he's the villain, suddenly the character goes into mustache twirling mode and all the cleverness behind his persona and his calculated plan is thrown away, and now he's just so overly evil that I can't take him seriously anymore. And I mean it, he was actually threatening in the earlier episodes of the show, but now he's unintentionally funny. Like he used to be very stoic and menacing and now he's just like yelling at people all the time because the show wants to remind you that he's evil he's the bad guy so he yells a lot the show does attempt to give him a tragic backstory in episode 7 in the form of the very common man was in love with woman but woman got killed so now man sad and man vengeful which is a trope that's gotten very tired and it's really lazy here like we never see their relationship or anything we don't even have time to get attached or invested in them they introduce that plot line and like three minutes later his girlfriend is killed so you're just like oh okay sure that's that's his origin i guess but aside from that general ben barnes is a good enough villain he's all right he's one of those villains you can tell is only here because the story needs a villain so you accept it but you're not really invested in whatever they're doing you're just like oh okay that's the guy they gotta defeat cool it's hard to figure out what his end game is it's very lightly explained and his backstory is literally given to you one episode before the end so you just don't really care by that point they keep calling him by these grand names like the darkling the black general the shadow summoner and i was just like okay now you're just trying very hard to not call him the dark lord and i sort of respect that however the show is also kind of bad at explaining why he can or cannot do certain things just like alina his power level becomes kind of incoherent we're told that he created the fold hundreds of years ago and now he wants to to make the fold bigger but apparently he can't do that on his own now now he needs another source of power we don't know why it's just what it is and also it's said in a very quick line that he also created the creatures in the fold and those creatures used to be humans okay so why doesn't he create more of them that sounds like it would solve a lot of his problems he's done it before so what's the issue here at first i thought it was because the creatures couldn't be outside of the fold but that's not the case because in the final scene of the season they're walking out of the fold so why why does this guy have any problems just expand the fold create more creatures march them out of the fold and wipe out everybody there's literally no conflict for you here because at times the show kind of tells you that even he can't control the creatures which makes sense because they attack him in the finale but then a few minutes later he walks out of the fold and he's in charge they're following him so he can control them okay that's actually cool but in that case why go through this entire inconvenience of scheming this whole machination to put himself in the ranks of the king and leading the second army and all that stuff this whole time he's had a pretty fucking efficient way to destroy his enemies and that would have stayed him probably hundreds of years but he just
just didn't do it? And I'm sure that all of those questions have very clear and sensical answers in the books or whatever, but in the show, it's never explained. So it all just comes across as really stupid. Because everyone in the show keeps talking about how fucking powerful Ben Barnes is and how he could just fuck up everyone like it's nothing and all that stuff. Like he's a really big deal apparently. So I spent the entire season waiting for him to show that power, but he never really does. He does some cool shit like doing the fucking shadow destructo disc thing where he slices people that's dope but for a guy as powerful as him he doesn't do all that much in this show but anyways ben barnes is just too charismatic and i can't hate him he's really good in the role he always delivers the black general is not a great villain but he's serviceable and he does the job in this story so yeah, okay, let's talk about the skinhead now. Mal in something, let's just call him Mal. Mal was a breath of fresh air for me. And trust me, I did not expect to say that. When I first saw him in a pilot, I was ready to be a smartass and just write him off as another YA pretty face that has for only function to look good on camera. But I was wrong. He actually turns out to be a pretty dope character. He does fall into some tropey cliches at points, but it wasn't anything too distracting to me. Honestly, he's fine. I think he's my favorite character on the show, actually. So Mal is Alina's best friend. They grew up together at an orphanage where they were bullied for being different and they spend their entire lives having each other's backs. Contrary to Alina, Mal is not a Grisha. He's just a regular dude. But he's also in the army and he's a really good fighter. But like I mentioned earlier, a few episodes in, Mal devolves into the my only personality as a character is my love interest problem that just irritates me. And I know that technically it's too early to call them love interest because their relationship hasn't evolved into that yet but this is a YA fantasy story we're talking about so I'm calling it right now they're probably gonna end up together and since the show keeps reminding us they're orphans they're either going to adopt kids at the end or run an orphanage together and you know what if I'm wrong I will come back on this channel when the story ends and make an apology video I've made a severe and continue. But jokes aside, there are moments in the show where some really big things happen to Mal that should really have an impact on his character. But instead of that, he just whines about wanting to see Alina. Episode 4 has that really tense action sequence in a forest where Mal gets shot and he falls on the ground. And it immediately cuts to another flashback of him and Alina that has absolutely nothing to do with what's currently happening. Like in the middle of the scene, they completely destroy the tension by cutting back to that shit and it goes on for a while and then he wakes up and i was actually really shocked to find out that his two buddies he was with were killed off screen and immediately after there's a voiceover of mal talking about alina instead of the two friends he just lost he's just there being like alina is my true north or whatever the fuck like what yo your boys are dead man what now what there's so many moments in this show that are truly intense and could be very powerful horrifying or emotional but they're all ruined because the show absolutely wants everything about Mal to be about Alina even when it really doesn't call for it. And it sucks especially in the case of Mal because if they had downplayed that aspect of him without completely deleting it, he truly would have been a great character. He has a lot of really good traits, I like his perseverance, his drive, his willingness to help, he has a good heart, I was invested in whatever he was doing. Oh and also I think it's fair to mention that after a while his plot armor becomes kind of funny. Like seriously, how much can this regular ass dude take before he just dies. He gets bodied by a fucking wendigo in episode 1, he gets shot in episode 4, he gets an arrow through the abdomen in episode 7, and like he always just walks it off. It's just a minor inconvenience to him and I think it's funny. But overall, there isn't that much to say about Mal, he's just there and I'm fine with that, I liked him. There are scenes here and there where he gets to be a real badass and it worked every single time for me. He talks about you all the time. What does he say? Oh wow. Well. But don't listen to these two they like to exaggerate that's what they do <laughs> look at him oh he's so easy to rile okay. is that annoying yeah. you yeah. Oh, come on, then you <laughs> you me there are more characters in the show. Like I said earlier, I would argue that there are too many of them, but they're not all that interesting. Like these guys were really fucking boring. I don't even remember their names for the most part, but they really were messing with the pacing of the show. This guy was funny, I guess. He was fine. They try a little too hard to make him the cool charismatic dude, but it worked at times, so I liked him. That said, their attempt at making him the super gunslinger got a bit ridiculous after a while because the gun flipping thing is just way overdone. He does it so much that it ends up looking like a parody of what they're actually trying to do and it made me laugh. Not enough. 
Stop spinning it! You would be so much more efficient in a fight if you didn't waste so much time! Oh, and then there's him. Whatever. He's just there. They also remember those who are kind. I'm sorry, sir, I don't care. This guy is just the most bland character ever for the entire show, and you decide to finally give him feelings and a personality one episode before the show ends? My apologies, you're not going to get me invested in him now. It's too little, too late, my guy. I did like this one, though. I think her name is Inej. She had an interesting but somewhat underdeveloped story. She felt kind of conflicted about whatever it is they were doing, and she was kind of like Batman, so it was fun to watch her do some Assassin's Creed vigilante shit. But overall, I was zero invested in this group and their storyline. It's by far one of the weakest points of the show for me. I mean, I was really into the Grisha stuff, even if I didn't fully understand it because the show is really shit at explaining things. But every time an episode cut back to these guys, I sort of checked out. They're just so uninteresting. I don't give a shit about their mission. I don't give a shit about their arcs. I don't give a shit about their heist. There's no stakes in their story. Especially because if you think about it, by the end, they don't really do anything. They spend spend the whole season going on a seemingly very important mission, but then they fail the mission, so they join the others in the final battle, they get their asses kicked, and then they just leave. They contribute absolutely nothing to this story. Another thing that bothers me is just how incoherent the communication between the characters can be. Especially with these three, and especially when it comes to crucial information that could mean life or death for them. That goes even more in the show's bigger problem with exposition, but it's worth mentioning here. There's an episode where Batman and her annoying friends have to go through the fold and they use this guy's train thing. And knowing how dangerous the fold is and how precise they're gonna need to be to get through it alive, you would think that characters we're supposed to believe are smart would gather as much information as they can to make sure they're safe, but no. The man who's making them cross starts giving them major information about the trip while in the middle of the trip. And they start asking very basic questions only when things start to go wrong. And it took me out of the entire scene because I was like, really? You didn't think to ask that sooner? This is kind of a big deal. You're making it sound like you just hopped in this guy's little train without thinking about it twice, which is very inconsistent with the characters you were presented to be. And I know I'm nitpicking here, but it's the kind of writing that makes me dislike characters because the show always presents them as smart and capable, but they keep doing the dumbest shit. The writers are just doing the characters a disservice here, and it's frustrating because these mistakes are easily avoidable. Be smart about your characters being smart. But while I can complain about all these things, I think it's worth noting that nothing in Shadow and Bone is worse than these two. Oh. My god. Listen, the writing in the show, while not awful, is not all that compelling. We've established that. Some of the dialogue is just really mediocre, and sometimes the acting is just terrible. And the problem with that is that every now and then, you're gonna get a scene with bad writing, bad dialogue, and bad acting. And it's really not fun. Because you want Ogrisha dead. Why am I even arguing with you? You're not here to change your mind on anything. Only to make yourself feel better about sending me to my death. I feel nothing about you. Well, I guess that makes you good at your job. This goes on for like five minutes. These two characters were by far the worst in the entire series. The show tries really hard to give them charismatic, witty dialogue, but it's just... Ugh, so bad. Every single scene with them made me roll my eyes. I hated these two. Even when they're in a really serious situation where they could die, they continue to awkwardly take flirty shots at each other. It's just so bad. Their scenes never have a point. Like, these are the moments that made me really dislike the show. Because that's the entirety of their scenes. That's all they do. And they just won't stop, and it's so annoying. Are all the Riskele so prudish? Are all Bruges so immodest? I'm just trying to stay warm. You know we can also soothe tempers. Calm someone in pain. Ease their mind. I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, but I think you should know. There's really nothing all that unique about fjord and men. So there is a brain inside all that muscle. Would you stop your wiggling? Oh, you're cold and clammy. It's like lying next to a burly squid. I do not want to relax. Well, why is that? What are you so afraid will happen? You're afraid you might start to like me. 
I can't wait till you get trounced by a girl. Not in this lifetime. I'll do it myself if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have anything special. <laughs> Nothing you need to hide. You're just a man. I speak six languages. It's part of my job. No, it's not natural for someone to be as stupid as he is tall, and yet... Oh, there you stand. Relax. This isn't where I have my way with you. For the love of God, shut the fuck up. I don't think they ever have a normal conversation throughout the entire show. It's always that lame, awkward back and forth that's supposed to be sexy and witty and playful. I talked about artificial charisma in my Bridgerton video, and this is a perfect example of that. These two fucking suck, their storyline sucks, and that's all I have to say about them. I would have loved the show way more if they hadn't been there. And now that I'm angry, I have no transition, and I'm just gonna start talking about something else that pissed me off. I really do not like the editing in Shadow and Bone. It's really bad. The 2001 swiping transitions are so absurd, and the fact that they use that in the middle of very serious situations is just such a weird choice. And also, I mentioned earlier that Alina spends a good portion of the show writing letters to Mal, and by far, the weirdest part of the editing in the entire show is when Alina is writing letters to Mal. You hear her voiceover as she writes it, but the editing is just so fucking strange. Because when she does that voiceover, they randomly throw a montage of previous scenes with very epic music, and it doesn't make sense. Because the way it's all cut together, it really just looks like the show just stopped itself in the middle of an episode to show you a trailer of what you just watch it's so bizarre like i'm the miracle the world has been waiting for or perhaps i know i'm a fraud an imposter no. i'm terrified Rina. of failure or success if i really do have this power who am i it's such a weird choice. I seriously don't know who made that decision, but they should not be able to work on this show again. Okay, I'm aware that this might be a bit of an exaggeration, but I don't care. These scenes are really bad. And if I can just bring up a tiny little thing that a lot of shows do that annoy me a lot, this is a nitpick, so don't pay too much attention to it. But for some reason, I absolutely hate it when characters do that thing where they talk to another character while walking in a circle around them. I always find it incredibly unnatural and it takes me out of a scene very quickly. But Shadow and Bone does it so many times that I just started laughing after a while. Stop doing the circle talking thing. Okay, moving on. The season finale, just like the rest of the show, it's fine. I really wasn't into the big culmination of all the conflicts. They tried to do this thing where all the characters from the show and all of their storylines kind of merge into a big final moment, a bit like the first season of Stranger Things did, but here it's done a little awkwardly. It's not bad, but it just wasn't as powerful as they seem to think it is, and in some places it feels a little forced. However, the episode had its moments. It was entertaining. I do like how the battle on the boat fluctuates between big action and horror, that was pretty fun. I like that Mal gets to fight the general one on one and he actually gives him a run for his money. That was good to see because Mal spends most of the show getting his shit rocked every time he fights. And his final line to the general is pretty fucking badass. Did you really think you could kill me? I don't have to kill you, Darkling. Your past will do it for me. I like that quick moment when Batman got to team up with that bitchy Grisha girl whose only personality trait is to hate Alina for no reason. I mean, until her family is in danger at the end or whatever. I just realized this show decided to give most characters their arcs and motivations at the end of the story. It's not very smart. I really like the final scene when the general comes out of the full with an army. It's very incoherent within the context of the show, but the scene was kick-ass. I like that Alina and Mal are going off on their own adventure together at the end because I don't think I can take any more of their constant whining about missing each other. Keep them together, I don't care. Like the finale has a lot of fun moments, but that's when I realized where I stood on it all. Shadow and Bone is okay. It exists, it's there. I can't really agree with people who call it a masterpiece and are telling me that it's great, but I also kinda disagree with people who say it's absolute garbage. I was always entertained while I was watching it, but I never got invested. The show is fun, but it's not really engaging. 
engaging. The characters are okay. The story is okay. The world seems really interesting, but it's so poorly explained that I thought it was just okay. By the end of it, I didn't really care about anyone or anything in it. It was just there and it was okay. Like, I don't give grades when I review things. I only did it for Emily in Paris, but if I were to grade Shadow and Bone, it would just be a five out of 10. It's fine. It's the middle of the road. The show is just very average. In a sense, it kind of reminds me of Rogue One. Like, it looks great. The fights are entertaining, but the characters are really bland and forgettable. The middle chunk of the story is insanely boring, and then the energy picks up towards the end. Kind of the same experience, except that, unfortunately for Shadow and Bone, it doesn't end with Dark fucking Vader walking into a ship and slicing motherfuckers left and right like it's butter. Okay, I'm gonna calm down now. In all honesty, I'm probably gonna check out season two. Maybe it'll be a bit more engaging because I'll be familiar with the characters and the universe already, and maybe it will actually build on the world and explain it better because there is some solid foundation there. I wanna know more about Ravka and I would like it to make sense. I hope Alina stops sucking as a character. I hope the stag comes back. I laughed every time it was on screen. I don't know why. In the end, most of the season felt like a first act. It feels like it's just setting up the world for the next season. So who knows? I don't care all that much, but I'm still curious to see more. Uh, also, I'm just gonna say it. Shadow and Bone is a really stupid title. Maybe I'm bitter.